Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 National High School Design Competition Judging. My name is Vasa Janopoulos, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Deputy Director of Learning and Audience Engagement at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Cooper Hewitt's mission is to educate, inspire, and empower through design. And we do this through our exhibitions, publications, and programs like the National High School Design Competition. This is our eighth year of the competition, and it's amazing to continue to see such passion and drive in high school students across the country. This year, we challenge teens to use design and data to support their community. And I'm thrilled to introduce our finalists, Sarah Lee, a junior at St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire, and Clarice Shun, a sophomore at Phillips Academy Andover in Andover, Massachusetts, Eleanor Lewis, a graduating senior at Design and Architecture Senior High in Miami, Florida, and Rory Stanford, a graduating senior at Bergen County Academies in Hackensack, New Jersey. They were selected from 707 incredible designs submitted by 975 students from 27 states across the country. Let's have a big round of virtual applause to the finalists. This all wouldn't be possible without our incredible partners who share our passion for design literacy. Their investment makes it possible for us to support the next generation of designers and design thinkers. We're so grateful to Adobe, eBay Design, Yaroslav Febyshenko and Jenny Rubinstein and Cooper Hewitt's Board of Trustees for supporting the 2023 National High School Design Competition. A special thank you also to our amazing judges today. Before we get started with the presentations, I'd love to invite our judges to introduce themselves. I'll turn it over first to Cooper Hewitt's director, Maria Nicanor, and feel free to pass it over to the next person on your screen. Thank you, Vaso, and hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining online and for watching our session today. My name is Maria Nicanor. I'm the director here at Cooper Hewitt. This is my first uh, National High School Design Competition. I'm super excited to have this conversation today. Very thankful to the rest of the judges that are joining us. This is one of our favorite programs in Cooper Hewitt, if I may say so, <laughs> because we don't only get to look at, uh, at design now, but we get to look at the future of design and maybe even future designers. Um, and we've just been really, really inspired by all the projects that we've received this year. So I'm very excited to be here. I'm looking forward to to hearing um, much more about all of the projects and to sharing the space with my fellow judges. And I'm going to pass it on to Eric Rodenbeck, who is just on my side on the little square. So Eric, over to you. Hello, I'm Eric Rodenbeck. Really happy to be here. I'm the founder and creative director at the company uh, Stamen Design. We are a mapping and data visualization studio um, that was honored um, with the Cooper Hewitt's National Design Award in 2017. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here and, and really happy to be giving back. We um, are a design studio that has designed data visualizations um, for people like the National Audubon Society, the Dalai Lama, Facebook, um, and artists and scientists all over the world. So we're really um, keen to explore projects at the intersection of data and design and culture. Um, and it's really great to be here with, um, with the future of the field. So congratulations, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'll pass it to Irene. Hi, I'm Irene Al, and I'm delighted to join you all today on this beautiful day. I am on the board of trustees for the Cooper Hewitt. Um, I'm currently design partner at a venture capital firm called Coastal Ventures, where I work with uh, early and mid-stage CEOs to help them be successful. Prior to Coastal Ventures, I've had a long history in human-computer interaction design and designing software, beginning my career at Netscape, and then uh, following that, I built and ran Yahoo and Google's human centered design practices, uh, and then later a startup called Udacity. So very pleased to be here, and I look forward to seeing the finalist projects. I'll pass it on to Christine. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to be here and to be participating in this event. Uh, my name is Christine Johnson. I'm a co-founder and executive director of design at an agency called Cognition Studio. Um, our uh, focus is um, upstream innovation for life sciences, where we are uh, take um, data um, and design for communications of how science works, how something works inside your body, how people can make uh, effective policy, 
or global health impact decisions. Um, I also volunteer with the AIGA Link program, which is an outreach program for high school students to enable the next generation of designers. And I will pass it over to uh, Yeshi. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Yeshi Milner. I am a data scientist and activist. I am the founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. We are a network of over 20,000 scientists and activists working to make data a tool for social change instead of a weapon of political oppression. My work started in high school and has since then really informed the range of work that we do in reclaiming data as protest, data as accountability, and data as collective action. I thank you so much for inviting me to judge. And um, again, congrats to the amazing finalists. I look forward to learning more from you about your projects. Thank you so much to our judges. Uh, and now it's my great pleasure to welcome our first finalist uh, for their presentation, the team of Sarah Lee and Clarice Shun. Please let me know if the screen is not um, shared for you. Is it visible for everyone right now? We can see it. We can see it, Clarice. Okay. Oh, not share. Hi, I'm Sarah, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm Clarice, and I also use she, her pronouns. And today we will be presenting our design project, Emotional Journey Map of Paralyzed Veterans. So here's a little bit more about me on the left. I'm a junior attending St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire. And my interest in this project stemmed from seeing my grandfather, who was paralyzed last summer, and his despair upon talking about getting on a plane to see his daughter in America. So I, so I began research on the subject of paralysis and planes, which led me to an article about a paralyzed veteran named Charles Brown, which was which was the main source of inspiration for our project. And with this project in mind, I brought the idea of an infographic to spread more awareness on such an issue to my friend Clarice. Hello, I'm Clarice, and I'm a sophomore attending Phyllis Academy Andover in Andover, Massachusetts. Thanks to the great opportunity Sarah shared with me, I was also able to share my own experiences associated with my uncle and grandparents who are also disabled and struggle to simply travel to other places, especially by planes. Overall, we both wanted to create an infographic and a design that would make it easier for people to understand and realize the struggles of people with disabilities during the traveling and boarding processes. So many people may not be aware of the challenges that wheelchair users face when they fly. So we did this project to raise awareness of these kind of issues and to inform the public about the emotional states people with disabilities experience. The statistics reveal the lack of knowledge American airlines have on disabilities. So from 2019 through 2021, nearly 21,000 wheelchairs and scooters were damaged, delayed, or lost by airlines. And in 2021, the Department of Transportation received a 54% increase in disability-related complaints from 2019. And only 4.5% of the top eight US airlines have accessible laboratories, while four don't have them at all. Now I'll give you a um, brief introduction of Charles Brown. Charles Brown is the national president of the Paralyzed Veterans of America, PBA, and a former US Marine Corps member who sustained a spinal cord injury in 1986. After reading this article illustrating Brown's discomforts traveling by plane, we analyze and empathize with the emotions people with disabilities may feel. The bottom right image shown right now is a map, map that shows the whole axis of um, flying. It may seem like nothing to ordinary passengers, but it can feel like a potential barrier to passengers who use wheelchairs. These, this article traces the flight processes of Charles Brown and provides a glimpse into his emotional state through the use of photos and vivid detailed descriptions that effectively convey his frustrations. For both of us, the article appeared to be a useful tool for emotional data analysis, as it offers a firsthand account of how a passenger feels during a flight and can be used to inform strategies for improving the overall flying experiences. So in approaching this project, we focused on the idea of data humanism and thought about how we could show Charles Brown's emotions at a glance. 
To summarize data, humanism is a philosophy that seeks to prioritize the needs and experiences of individuals and communities when collecting, analyzing, and using data. And it emphasizes the importance of empathy, ethics, and social responsibility in the process of using data to inform decision-making. And emotional data refers to information that relates to the emotional state or experiences of individuals or groups of people. It's essential because it can provide insight into how people feel about certain topics, events, or situations. And we approach this project with the same six processes as shown on the screen. So as we explored the different options, we concluded that the customer journey map was the most suitable format to present our findings. And in order to create an effective infographic, we referred to existing references and began analyzing how the journey maps could best express emotions. By looking at different journey maps, we were able to set the direction for the infographic that we wanted to create. So we focused on how the maps effectively conveyed emotions and used this as a guide to creating a compelling visualization of Brown's emotional journey during his flight. And throughout this process, we were able to provide a more comprehensive understanding of the emotional impact of air travel, which can inform strategies for improving the overall flying experience for passengers. Our ideation process involved analyzing the journey of Charles Brown based on the article. And we broke down the journey into different parts and analyzed in detail to gain insights into Brown's emotional state and the overall impact of the journey on his well being. We also had a discussion about which parts of the journey should be focused on and why. We thought this would help us to identify key areas that required attention and improvement to ensure a better experience for all passengers, including people with disabilities. We started by listing the processes from check in and security to handling luggage and order. We then highlighted key sentences in red letters and classified them as potential pain points. Based on the idea sketch, the process involved working with Adobe Illustrator. To better understand Brown's emotional journey, we divided emotions into nine different types and used different colors to represent each emotion. By mapping the appropriate emotions to each sentence, we were able to create a visual representation of Brown's emotional journey during the flight. And these are the nine symbolized emotions that we created. We designed the emotions as icons rather than just using colors. For example, as you could see, hunger was expressed by emptying the inner space to capture the feeling of emptiness, while anxiety was designed to express the anxious feeling one feels when surrounded by many people. And this is our original design. So in this design, we place the general flight process that everyone experiences right under each numbering to provide a comparison with Charles Brown's flight process. And to make the most important emotion stand out, we overlapped several emotions and changed the size of the icons to express the intensity of each emotion. For example, hunger was continuously expressed in processes two through five, since Mr. Brown had not eaten or drunk anything before boarding the plane. So this project aims to bring awareness to the emotional experiences of disabled veterans during air travel. And we hope that it will help improve the overall travel experience for disabled veterans. Through the feedback and pieces of advice we received during Mentor Weekend, we, ref we refined our design by incorporating references from airline safety cards and researched pamphlet designs. Our aim was to create a more intuitive experience by integrating illustrations with the text. And to make the design more practical, we have decided to create a pamphlet that can be used not only on a plane, but also at an information desk or around the airport. The pamphlet form is considered to be ideal for this purpose. And as the screen shows, we developed our visualizations to create a more appealing design. Through the developments we made, we created this updated final design of our project. The first page, as you can see, of the project contains the nine symbols we created. And by doing so, we wanted to ensure that the audiences and readers can understand and comprehend the symbols effectively, which would be shown continuously throughout the pamphlet. And this is the front side of the pamphlet. On the introduction page, we added the QR code link to the New York Times article and several statistics for the audiences to understand the purpose and potential effects of this pamphlet. And as you can see, we added a series of illustrations to show each step and summarize the original sentences to make it more concise. However, we still tried to keep most of the details in each sentences based on the comments that we gathered from our friends and families that have often trouble grasping each scenario's detail when the sentences were too simple. 
We also kept the sequence of emotions on the top part of the pamphlet to emphasize the variety of emotions Charles Brown experienced while traveling. And this is the backside of the pamphlet. We have planned and made this project to support PVA, so we put the PVA logo on the back. This is our final project if you were to print it out as a physical copy and have it at a plane or at an information desk. We have also decided that a matte coated paper would be the most suitable material for this project due to its lower costs and common usage in pamphlet type products. By using this material, we hope to create a practical and cost effect effective product that can be distributed widely. And here's the back cover of our physical copy. We also considered another version, a supplement to our final design. We designed a card set with emotions and corresponding descriptions on the back. The title for this card set would be the Box of Emotions card set. This card is intended for educational purposes, targeting students and airline staff. The goal is to provide an opportunity to educate those who interact with veterans due to the nature of their job, while also raising awareness among the general public. And since the card set is for educational purposes, we consider adding a short introduction to the backside of the card set that explains the context and the importance of noticing these emotions people with disabilities could experience. The front side of the card depicts the visualizations of Charles Brown's experiences, which can help, help grab the attention of broader audiences and provide a brief overview of what they could expect to learn from the card set. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And now please, now, feel, free please feel free to, to ask us ask any, us any, any questions. questions. And um, also, if you have any questions for um, the presentation itself, um, please let me know so I could um, pull up the slides anytime. Thank you, Clarice and Sarah. I'm happy to get us started while the rest of the judges think of some questions. Um, thank you for your clarity. You were really clear in explaining the philosophy behind the project, your process, all the steps that, that got you there. Um, and, and I'm very impressed by, by the final product. Um, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more. You 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 talk about the pamphlet about like this ideal format that um, that you end up using and then you decided to add the box right after it. Can you tell us why you decided to do that and why not just stay at the pamphlet? It could have been you know a very informational piece. Why did you feel you needed more? So at first when we decided to do the pamphlet um, we were thinking of it. We were thinking the pamphlet as like a design that could be incorporated on a plane because an, on the plane we see kind of those safety cards that look like pamphlets. So and since um, this experience that we were kind of portraying through the pamphlet was a experience that happened on the plane, we thought that it would create a like a deeper connection between the passenger when they're on the plane and actually reading the pamphlet. So the the original pamphlet was we were thinking of being at the planes, but we decided to, we were thinking about like through Mentor Weekend as we, we were getting feedback throughout the process. Um, they were mentioned about like, what about thinking about the broader audience? Like um, the mentors like told us told us multiple times that like um, this, this can be like, this can be kind of incorporated in a plane, but like how could you like spread more awareness to like a broader um, audience? And then we started thinking like coming up with ideas, um, what could be useful and we thought about this idea of cards and education at like the same time in a way that kind of would catch the attention of um people quick in, in, in a like in a quick way that it's also efficient so then we thought about like what if we had like these cards that had like emotions and like what like the descriptions on like on the back and we had it as like a card box so people can like just like um if we have it at like school at like a table or something um, it would be like an efficient way for us to kind of wider the audience, like beyond just like people on the plane. So that idea of creating the card stemmed from like our desire to kind of um, kind of provide more awareness to this issue to a broader audience and not just simply like passengers on a plane. Thank you. Hi, um, 
Congratulations on a great project. Um, it's beautiful and it's informative. It's really well considered. And um, I especially appreciate how you were inspired by customer journey mapping. That's a real tool that's used um, you know, in industry. And so it's so nice that you have um, in, uh, applied these specific skills towards this endeavor. And uh, what's really striking to me is how you highlight the emotional experience of the disabled uh, passenger and bring that to the forefront rather than just as one of many uh, variables. Um, this is really like the whole point of the project, which I think is so important. Um, so thank you for, for bringing to the forefront the importance of the emotional journey and experience that people have, because at the end of the day, that's really what we're left with. Um, I understand that this project is really intended for educational purposes, but I'm curious to hear, like, number one, what would you do if you had more time? And number two, what changes or action do you hope would be taken as a result of these efforts? Like beyond like expanded educational awareness, say like everybody on the plane or involved in travel is fully aware of um, the emotional journey. What action or change do you hope to inspire by this work? Um, so basically, if um, for your first question, if we had more time, um, we were both um, also thinking about creating like a um, platform for this emotional journey itself. And if we had more time, we would have been able to kind of like further expand this project into um, like a website or maybe like a social media platform that people could easily um, access through uh, without um, uh, to expand like the broader audiences since um, the pamphlet is more for the passengers on the airplane or maybe people in the airport who are going to be information um, staffs and desks so if we had more time we would have um, created a more uh, for the broader audiences such as for like create a website or maybe like a social media platform and for a second question um, our objective, um, our main objective is um, to create a change within um, the policies within the um, air, airplanes and even in airports as well. So for example, um, based on the statistics that we gained from um, the Department of Transportation, um, we had these statistics that um, although um, people with disabilities struggle with the TSA screenings, um, although they're on the wheelchairs, some staff are not educated well enough or informed enough and ask them to stand up or maybe move around to, to um, complete the screening. And we thought we could um, educate and inform those people and then change um, the experiences that people with disabilities may experience um, and the frustration they go through, um, especially for Charles Brown, since um, He's, he's on a wheelchair and he goes into the plane and um, two staff are needed and required for him to be uh, placed to his own seat in the plane. And we thought um, this uh, pamphlet and this project could maybe change those policies and those um, seating um, programs. So um, those people with disabilities and people who use wheelchairs would have a, a better experience with traveling. And kind of building, like adding on to what like Clarice said, um, we were um, thinking about this as well, but ideally, like we were hoping that um, this physical copy, if, if could be actually like there on planes and how it could be a starting point for us to work with organizations like the DAV or like the, um, like the, uh, the PBA to like kind of work together to kind of um, like, fight fight for the rights that should be kind of taken care of in a way because I feel like through through like the research that we've done we've realized kind of a lot of um knowledge that was neglected and the need for some action to be done in order to kind of establish this fairness within like the system so um we were hoping that in like as we move on even like beyond this competition we were thinking of like what we could do to actually kind of reach out to these organizations and kind of play a role that so that this pamphlet that we have kind of designed 
could be in action in airplanes, but also kind of serve as like a catalyst for us to kind of continuously like push for the need for some actions to be required to better accommodate like paralyzed veterans. Um, I have a question. Um, thanks for a really well thought out and beautifully executed presentation and, and, and project. I'm really uh, impressed with it. Look forward to seeing what else you get up to. Um, I have a formal question about the, the design of the emotional uh, symbols. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about that, um, about the shapes, about the colors, um, about whether they are whether people are able to read them. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a really interesting notion to try to represent emotions with glyphs and colors. I've, I've done some of it myself. And um, so I'm just curious how that, how that went for you. And, um, you know, did you, did you have conversations about the specific looks of those? I'm sure you did, but I'm just, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how, how you went about assigning those specific uh, forms and shapes to the, to the work. Yeah, so definitely. Um, so uh, since we have like around like nine of those icons, I'll just briefly um, explain the ones um, that is in my head right now. So like, for example, for the expression for hunger, um, if you guys remember the, it was, oh, um, oh I, I could pull up the slides yeah. if you, yeah. Yeah, I'd love, slides. I think yeah. it'd be good to, to talk with in front of the designs, thanks. They're beautiful, by the way. Okay, so when we were thinking about the design of hunger, we were thinking about like, we first like, we kind of approached in a way where like, how do you feel, like by asking each other questions, like how do you feel when you're hungry? And we kind of came to this idea of emptiness. And we were like, how, how would we kind of portray this emptiness that we could show in the emotional journey? So that's why like hunger, we kind of only drew like the outline part and made the middle like totally empty kind of to show that this feeling of emptiness that comes with hunger. And like, for example, like um, think like the icon of anxiety. So when we're, an we're anxious, like we feel like we're in like the, I, I'm gonna try to express it the best way I can. So anxiety, we thought of it as like kind of, we're kind of, you're doing we feel great. like we're, we're like, there's just like so many things going on like around and you just feel like, you, you don't feel quite like, calm in a way when you're anxious and there's just so many like things going on in the in the outer world that your inner self feels very anxious so we try to show that through like the designs of um, multiple having multiple like circles on the outside as well um and upset when was, oh, yeah. oh if you want to go ahead oh um no, no. adding on to that so like for example the embarrassment as you could see it's like a square um shaped with um, dots on it. And we, when we were talking about embarrassment, we were like trying to express it through um, like just making initial sketches about embarrassment. And we um, both um, agree with the point that um, we could express embarrassment as like a stiff appearance in like an awkward situation with like many people. So like we were like, feel, felt like we were like trapped in a square box and we um, wanted to portray that, so we created those sim uh, the embarrassment symbol as like a square with um, circles in like a very stiff um, position. And um, happiness, which is not really um, commonly like used in those um, emotional journeys since um, his emotional journey is um, mostly frustration and um, very like painful. So however, um, we, thought that happiness could be designed to be like a sparkling figure, like representing like the best mood and like a dazzling light, which um, I think most people would agree with. And also since um, it's a very, um, like a rare emotion that he shows throughout the emotional journey, we thought we could create um, happiness into a more um, contrasting color, which is yellow in this point. And lastly, um, I think I could talk about relief um, since it looks very like curved. So um, we wanted to express like a sense of stability and to show like the feeling of like spreading that emotion to the surroundings 
when you're like relieved, you want to just be calm and then comfortable and you want to like share that to other people. So we use that appearance of like water droplets and falling on the surface to create this um, specific symbol. And um, we uh, sadly, we didn't add the initial sketches, but um, our initial sketch process was um, very um, complicated at first since we had to um, represent these specific emotions into like a, de uh, a design, but we had a really a fun journey throughout making these symbols, if that answers your question. It, it looks like it, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much to Sarah and Clarice for that wonderful presentation. It's now my pleasure to welcome Eleanor Lewis. All right, so I'm going to share the screen and let me know if you can see this. All right, is that all, is that all showing up okay? It's good. We can see it, Eleanor. All right, perfect. So hello, I'm Eleanor Lewis, pronouns she, her, and this is Plant Resilient Miami. So I have lived in South Miami my entire life, and I grew up hiking, biking, and wandering through its natural areas. I recently graduated from Design and Architecture Senior High, and I'm an incoming freshman at Columbia University studying architecture. In many of my projects, I like the ones on the right, I focus on bringing native plants back into urban cores. This project began when I started to realize that many of the native plants I was researching for my designs could no longer survive long term in South Florida's changing climate. South Florida is a place that is completely distinct from anywhere else on the continent in many ways, but um, especially botanically. And what and one thing it and at the it's sorry, it's located at the tip of the Floridian Peninsula, where the, flo the floras of North America and the tropics meet. Our tropical monsoonal climate is found nowhere else on the continent, which means that the area is home to countless unique native plants. However, due to rising temperatures and sea levels, many of these habitats are being threatened. Within decades, we could see a catastrophic loss of biodiversity. Already, we are seeing the effects of these climate shifts. These are photos that I took of an open pine tree recently planted in my neighborhood. These are two plants that are often used by landscape architects for public green space, but they are now becoming increasingly stressed in these environments. This is primarily due to climate change, as well as the heat island effect. Heat islands, or urbanized areas that are hotter than their surroundings, often occur due to rapid and dense urbanization. They disproportionately affect historically disenfranchised communities because of less long-term investment in landscape architecture and shade trees in these areas. Saltwater intrusion occurs when rising sea levels cause ocean water to leach into the groundwater supply, poisoning plants from their roots. This can cause massive plant die-off and catastrophic damage to ecosystems. Plant Resilient Miami began as an idea to give everyone the tools to make their community more green, more livable, and more resilient. In this mock-up, it utilizes a simple graphic style to convey hyper-localized information about changes in temperature and saltwater intrusion risk and uses these factors to give a list of recommended native plants that will survive in these areas in the long term. Users can also specify a time frame, meaning they can see which plants will thrive for the next 20 years versus the next 50. The streamlined interface is accessible to everyone, from community gardeners to landscape architects. I use this diagram illustrated in the book Data Action by Sarah Williams, who is the lead mentor for Mentor Weekend, as a framework for further development as well as for this presentation. In this image, using data to create change is expressed as a cycle from building expert teams to building, quantifying, ground truthing, sharing and visualizing data, and so on. So first, I reached out to experts and built a team. Soon after being named a finalist, I attended a local conference on smart cities at the University of Miami. I talked to everyone I could about about the data that they were working on, the projects they were researching, and my own ideas. 
I realized that many people were working hard to collect data on things like heat islands and saltwater intrusion, but a lot of the data was being underutilized. I made connections, sent emails, and arranged Zoom calls, and this is how I found many of the data sets that I used for this project. Next, I reached out to botanists from Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden to discuss the best resilient plants for a change in climate, as well as the nuances of this issue. I also use the garden's plant database to locate and photograph specific native plants in their environment. Then I had the amazing opportunity to visit MIT for the mentor weekends, where I learned about QGIS and data visualization from some of the top experts in the field. This helped springboard my project into the next level and bring it into the real world. And finally, I got help from friends and family with coding, specifically writing a Python script that improves the long-term scalability of this project meaning that the area included um, could be rapidly expanded in the future. I use data from three sources. Um, so, so localized temperature readings in order to locate heat islands, predicted sea level rise in order to predict saltwater intrusion, and a native plant, plant database, which specifies which plants uh, have a higher saltwater tolerance versus lower, higher heat tolerance versus lower, and uses to give specific recommendations for each location. Then I layered the data in the mapping software QGIS. This allowed me to see how the data overlaps to predict specific growth conditions for each site. Then I use this in tandem with a plant database to see which plants will grow best where, combining the non-spatial plant database with spatial forms of mapping for the first time. Then it came time to ground truth um, the data. And in order to do this, I went all over Miami, taking photographs of everywhere from my school's garden to botanic gardens, to the beach, to the metro rail. And this allowed me to connect my data with the real world, seeing if the plants that I predicted would thrive in certain areas were really thriving there. After that comes sharing data. In order to do this, I turned my original concept into a real website, plantresilient.com. Now I'm gonna take a moment to give you a tour. So when the site opens, you, I'm gonna refresh this. When the site opens, um, you immediately see this interactive map displaying heat data for each block. When you click on a block, it pops up, um, it pops up with an icon conveying localized heat and saltwater intrusion risk data. I designed these icons in order to visually represent um, each block's distinct environmental conditions in a way that is immediately comprehensible. And um, at the bottom of the screen, there is a timeline that allows you to view how temperatures and saltwater intrusion will shift in the coming decades. So you can click here and it'll take you to a new page. Um, but for instance, I can use it to show you how this specific block um, changes from 2050 to 2070, uh, meaning that the conditions are completely different and the plants that will grow there will be completely different over those decades. When you click on local analysis, it opens in a new tab and it, this page gives you the icon again, but also specific planting recommendations, explicitly stating this area is hotter than surrounding areas, potentially being due to, due to being located in a heat island. And if you click that, it links to an informative page on heat islands and suggests planting shade trees as a way to mitigate the effects of rising temperatures. It explains that due to the high risk of saltwater inundation, all plants below are saltwater tolerant. Then you can scroll through different types, different categories of plants um, to select which you would like to plant. And shade trees are located at the top as a top recommendation. Clicking on one, it takes you to an external resource, Natives for Your Neighborhood, um, which is a database that has a, just so much information on each of these plants such as their care instructions and where you can get them from a specific local nursery. And finally, I designed these yard signs created designed to spark community action and bring people together to create a greener and more resilient Miami for decades to come. So thank you so much. And I would like to invite all of you to scan this QR code to go to the mobile version of the site. 
I will also link the desktop version in the chat. If you have visited before, because I know it was sent out, I still recommend uh, checking it out because I have changed quite a few things since you probably last saw it. Um, and I would like to give the rest of time to questions and critique. Thank you again. Eleanor, congratulations on a really fantastic project. I'm um, really impressed by the efforts you undertook. I mean, you went to conferences, you reached out to people, you networked, you collaborated, you coded, you integrated existing databases for multiple sources, you designed and implemented this thing, and you even have a mobile and a desktop version. <laughs> it's just incredible. Um, I guess the one question I have is like, are you going to continue this project um, going forward? Like, what's your plan or vision for this long term? Yes, absolutely. So this is an idea I'm really passionate about. And sort of throughout this, my attitude towards this project has been, I'm going to use all of these incredible resources that I'm getting as a result of being a finalist, like the opportunity to work with some of the top experts in this field to make this a real thing. And um, I've been reaching out to um, some different organizations, like I was talking with the UM data science department, trying to figure out how I could really make this a real thing. And, you know, talking to stu even student run organizations that focus on community gardening to see how this project, this tool could help them and how it could like create real world change. Um, I think you might be muted. Sorry. Am I, can you hear me? <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Eleanor, uh, for your amazing project and for your presentation. As I said, I'm also based in Miami and I'm a Miami native. And um, I mean, this work is totally urgent and applicable and like actionable right now. I'm so impressed and inspired by how you use just a multitude of different data sources in a way that really came together so nicely. and. I guess my question is, what are, yeah, just really, really brilliant. What are other, um, what are other data sources that you might've wished you had? And cause I know for me, that's often um, yeah. when, when we're relying on open data, um, you know, we have a whole wish list of things that if we had this, what could we use? And yeah. And anything else you want to share about how you were able to do such an amazing mix method analysis and have it come together so beautifully visually, but also like um, make it interactive for people to, to use. Yeah, so in terms of data that I wish was accessible, um, I think NASA has a ton of data from the Landsat 8 that is what I would love to have that for this project, but there are very few people who are capable of transform transforming that, the way that that data is expressed in code and just pure numbers into a visual representation. So there are very few visual representations, which is a total shame because we have these inc this incredible technology in space um, that is constantly collecting this data, but because of data display, um, we don't we, we can't view a lot of it. And I think that shows the importance of having people out there that are making this information accessible um, to the public. Um, so that would that would be definitely something I would love to have. Um, I definitely had to email a couple of people to get the data that I have, like a lot of people actually, um, because a lot of it is not really out there. It's not that accessible. It's something I have to um, like reach out to people who are studying this specifically in school to get that information. Um, in terms of like how I executed the project, um, I had to try a lot of different methods because and learn a lot of different things throughout the period because there was a lot of stuff that didn't work. I learned QGIS, but I I'm not able to upload QGIS onto the web and the file was also just way too huge. So what I had to do is go block by block and physically outline each of the blocks for the map. And I'm sort of figuring out a way to automate that. So we're getting there with Python. But in order to create this map, I did have to like hand draw like 120 little blocks for the demo and then in manual import put about 360 you know 300 i think exactly 360 blocks worth of data because 
that's, um, that's each map, you know, 2020, 2050, 2070 is separate data values. Um, so I did create a system to make it easier, like giving, assigning each um, combination of salt water level and heat level a specific category code that, and, you know, making 25 categories. So that made it a little simpler because I did, because there is no way to create 360 individualized cards. Um, but that that's sort of how, how the process went. And it was my first time really making this kind of map website. I have not worked with that before. So that was uh, definitely a learning curve and experience, but I think I definitely learned a lot. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Oh, also, um, in case you missed it, I just wanted to point out that I did put the link in the chat. It just, it took me a couple seconds. Hi, Eleanor. Uh, thank you for your amazing project. It's it's uh, beyond inspirational. And, and I think just hearing you explain uh, what it was like to learn about and work with the data um, is inspiring uh, for sure. When you think about uh, the impact that your project has and what it can do um, in other areas, what do you dream about? What do you think that you want to kind of snowball or impact uh, in other areas? Yes, so I would love for this tool to be expanded specifically at two coast side areas. Um, and I would, I mean, my larger goal in what I'm doing in architecture and what I'm, you know, hopefully studying for is to make the world a more, a greener, more equitable place. And I would love to see this tool be used, um, especially by people planning large scale urban developments to create these green spaces for people in, you know, cities that are suffering from heat islands that are going to have that positive impact that they want. And I don't want like people to um, be worried or about planting, you know, planting big green spaces in these urban environments because they might say, oh, these heat islands will just kill these plants. You know, we can't plant here. And I really want to show people that gardening in these urban spaces is possible, it's important, and it can change the world. Do we have time for one more? Uh, one more question, sure. Um, thanks for this. Really amazing to see uh, the dedication that you've uh, placed on this. I'm I'm curious whether, having worked with um, with real data, um, whether you um, changed any of your like. It's one thing to imagine uh, one of these projects, and it's another thing to actually build it with real data. And I'm curious, having gone through that experience, whether that has changed anything about what you had initially planned or if you learned anything that you were maybe was surprising i'm i'm just curious to talk to someone who's sounds like for the first time in, engaging with this process of uncovering what the real data is instead of what we might wish the data says yeah um that's one thing that my architecture teacher said when we were starting this project like it's pretty much exactly that like remember the data isn't what you want it to be it's it's what it is and I found that out very fast once um, I started trying to make this a real thing because my original sketch, it, um, I really was just, I was like, of course this data would be out there. You know, of course, of course there's information on heat islands and, you know, predictions for how South Florida is going to warm up and saltwater intrusion. Of course this is out there. And it, then it was not, <laughs> yeah, um, totally. it wasn't. And that meant that I had to sort of, use a lot use what i could you know using climate using sea level rise to predict saltwater intrusion um there's because there's nothing on saltwater intrusion and all of that I, I had to sort of you know figure out and sort of i guess as um professor williams book put it hack it um a lot more than i thought i would have to <laughs> It's a good lesson to learn early. I'm glad. Well, thank you so much for sharing so thoughtfully about your project, Eleanor. Um, it's now my great pleasure to welcome Rory Stanford for her presentation.
Hi, my name is Rory. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm so honored to get to present my project for Cooper Hewitt's Design with Data competition, Art Needs More Color. Um, and it's an interactive museum exhibit on intersectionality as it applies to Black women in the arts. Just a bit about, about myself. Um, when I first heard about Cooper Hewitt's theme for this year's challenge, I knew that I wanted to use data that affected me personally, but that could also help my community. Um, so I'm a senior at Bergen County Academies, and these past four years I've studied visual arts, and my work is on the right. Um, so I self-identify as an artist. I also self-identify as a Black woman, and I wanted to merge these two and um, focus my project on the recognition of Black women in the arts. Um, um, intersectionality says that individuals who are part of multiple identities face more difficulties than um, individuals who just experience racism, sexism, et cetera. And as a Black woman in the arts, I have experienced challenges and noticed challenges um, just because of my race and gender. So I wanted to explore how I could share that information with my community. And um, I did some research and I came across the 2022 Burns Halpern Report. And that's what I decided to base my project on. To introduce my project, I'd like to start with a statement. And it's the same statement that I would give to a user if they walked into my museum exhibit. If we make art in color, why are the majority of these points colorless? My data comes from the Burns Halpern Report, as I mentioned earlier, and it explores intersection, intersectionality in the arts. Color here is used to represent diversity in the art world or art, uh, art made by women, by Black people and by Black women. So clearly, no, there are not enough colorful dots and art does need more color. I represented each data point um, with by a, rep represented it with a thousand artworks. So there are 340 total points. Um, and as the report says, out of 340,000 total artworks, only 38,000 were created by women, 7,000 were created by black people and 2,000 were created by black women. Um, and in general, it's important to be aware of what art is being shown in museums. Um, Black women make up 6.6% of the US population, but only 0.5% of museum acquisitions. And if we're just not taking into consideration art made by that margin of people, it's almost like a biased data set and we're not um, being fully aware or understanding fully our nation and our culture. So that's why I wanted to tackle this issue. Um, my museum exhibit consists of three walls. Um, the introduction wall, where um, the user can learn more about the subject, about the report, and about the context behind the issue. Um, the data wall in the center um, with the data points, additional facts, and also drawers full of artist cards, which I'll explain later, and the interactive screen on the right. Start with the introduction. Um, for more context, I provide users with the exact number of artworks that were collected and the exact data points from the Burns Halpern report, and also some context behind the issue, because whether artists lack the funding to attend art schools, are not able to work professionally full time, or just are not being shown in exhibits, um, they just aren't being shown in museums. I also have a simple key to illustrate the idea of intersectionality. Um, the green, which represents art created by American women, intersects with the yellow, um, which represents art created by Black, Black Americans, um, to create this pink shape, which is art created by Black American women. It's also important to note that my exhibit touches on very systemic issues. I'm not trying to solve racism or solve sexism or eliminate the issue of intersectionality within the art world but um, just help that issue and create change. I want to provide a space um, in these museums where we can see the stories that aren't being um, told right now and share art by black women with the world. Moving on to the data wall. This is a close up of the wall that I showed earlier. And as you can see, there's additional facts and information 
such as that acquisitions by women peaked in 2009, or that contemporary artists are right now the best represented in museums. So for curious users, you can learn more and um, also observe these data points. This is one of the first iterations of my data wall. And as you can see, um, the number of points are the same, but the placement is different, the colors are different, and also the symbols are different. Um, initially, it was more of a static wall mural, and um, I just left the data there for users to make their own connections and own conclusions. Um, but as I moved on, I realized I wanted more of an interactive exhibit. This was another iteration I created in Adobe Illustrator, and while it's cleaned up, I still wasn't happy with the final project. So I created this, and as you can see, and I landed on this for a number of different reasons. Um, first, I'd like to mention the placement of the dots. I wanted to draw the user's eye towards that art made by Black women. Um, so I have the two pink dots in the center, surrounded by the yellow, surrounded by the green, and surrounded by those colorful, colorless dots. Um, I also wanted to mention the symbol choice. Initially, I had sort of this face shape, but then I realized it was a bit too generic, and I was grouping artists a bit, um, a bit too much without giving them an individual voice. So I decided to go with the um, more simple circle for the data points and then save the phases for later to give the artist more of an individual voice. Um, in terms of color scheming, I also decided on the scheme on the left for contrast reasons. And since I wanted to draw the eye towards those pink dots, I um, made them different from the yellow and green so that they stand out more. Um, in terms of how it works, as I mentioned before, it was more of a static mural in, in its original design, but I wanted to encourage user participation and make it more interactive. Um, so I created this model. And so basically when a user observes the data point on the wall, they can grab this and it would open like a drawer and the drawer would contain various artist cards. And these artist cards can be taken home um, by the user or just kept in the museum but they have more information on the artist, their work, whether their work was acquired or not, and a QR code for more information on the back. This is an example of a card I designed for Bisa Butler, who is a Black American woman known for her fiber and textile work and her quilted portraits. And um, as you can see, it shows some of her work and additional facts about her. This works with the interactive screen display. If a user were to scan the card that I designed for Visa Butler, they would see something like this, which shows more of her work and more facts about her, maybe where she's located in this museum. And so I just wanna share this art um, right there in the museum so that um, users can learn more about Black American, Black, Black female artists. I also have some different screen options as more of a slideshow when an artist card isn't being scanned. Um, such as featured exhibits at the museum, recently acquired works by that museum, works that have not yet been acquired, and also any of these in video format. I'd like to personalize this exhibit for other museums. Um, as I just showed on the last slide, that was an example of a template I made for Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum, but it could also be done for um, the Met or the Guggenheim to name a few. Um, in general, I do want this exhibit to have an impact on my community. I want it to share the art of Black women with the world and also encourage Black women to continue making art. And I also want to um, spread change in the way that people view Black women as artists and encourage museum curators to think about these issues um, within the art world. And thank you so much. I would take questions now. Thank you so much, Rory. Uh, this is a very museum specific uh, project as well. So I'm very happy to, to start with, with some questions. It's a key topic. We think about it all the time. You mentioned 3.5% uh, of museum acquisitions being from Black women, which is a staggering figure. Um, I'm actually very interested in the last part that you talked about, about personalizing it for museums and, um, and your findings. I'm very curious about what you found and if you got into some of um, I was going to say their websites, but I'll say our websites. When you go into our museum websites, we put a lot of effort sometimes to digitize our collections to make them findable and searchable, but it's never, never enough. 
Um, and it sounds like you've screened a couple of institutions and collection databases. And I'm very curious um, for, your, for, for your findings and your feedback on what you found and was it relevant? Did it help your project further? What did you see in what you found in, in museum databases that could have better informed your project perhaps? Yeah, I did a lot of research on that. Um, I actually looked at the Cooper Hewitt website among others. And um, a lot of museums show temporary exhi exhibitions by Black women or by Black people or by women um, without acquiring it into their permanent collection. So that was a really important fact for me, um, just because acquiring a work into a permanent collection has more of an impact. Um, they're getting paid more, they're getting more recognition. So that's why I wanted to focus my exhibit on that. Um, I also researched exactly what artists and artworks were being collected because some of them are just from the same artist and then we're not recognizing all Black women artists or a large majority of them. Um, and just in general, I was seeing what types of art were collected and um, when also because time frame um, plays like a lot, a big role in my project. Um, acquisitions by Black women peaked after both the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too movement. Um, and they're still rising, but not at a high rate. So that was another fact that I picked up from the museum websites. And yeah, all of this just has an impact on um, what I used for my project. I would just say that it would also be so th thanks for this really such important work. Um, the first thing, one of the first things that I would want to look at is is the data over time, you know, to see to see whether it's going in the right direction or not. So just just a comment, not really a question, because I know you, I know you have it from a slice in in time, but then the the sort of and a lot of times what visualization does is doesn't necessarily answer all the questions, but maybe gives you new questions to answer. Right. Uh, to look for answers to so maybe that's maybe I can turn that into a question is you know what what are what are some other questions now that you want to ask now that you know what you know and have communicated it so clearly um yeah I would like to look at also the different issues that play into this I mentioned it briefly but um sometimes it's not just an issue of museum curators wanting to show art by black women but also if they have access to it if um artists are getting the funding they need to be able to go to art school to work professionally and to get their name out there. Um, so I would love to look more into that and how these systemic issues really play into that. Um, and also, as you mentioned, just over time because acquisitions by women peaked in 2009, which was a long time ago, and we're not acquiring more of their work, um, but I would love to look at why and also how this can be changed. I have a question. Thank you so much for this project. And one of the things that I love about your project and that it um, uses data to make what we like to call the invisible visible and to really name the issue for people. And I think, you know, um, I'm just thinking about from the experience of museum goers and people in the museum community, when they go to this exhibit, what are some of the hope, things that you hope that they'll they'll leave and what are some actions that you hope they'll take? Um, and also briefly what your, in addition to my question, I wanted to say that um, your project really reminds me of an amazing um, exhibition that was part of the most recent Whitney Biennial by, by an artist, Candace Williams, um, the Cassandra Free Press Library. That is really awesome. Check it out. If you probably, you may have already know about it, but yeah, what are some of the things that you want um, museum goers to feel and to experience and also what actions do you want them to take from experiencing your exhibition? Right, um, a lot of users just aren't aware of the issue. So that would be the first thing, just making them aware. Um, a lot of our um, museum goers see ex exhibitions that are done like um, Black History Month exhibition or something and they think something is being done, but really, nothing is being done. Um, and we talk about racism, sexism and intersectionality, but change isn't really implemented. So I kind of wanna show that um, the data isn't really changing. They're still not being re um, represented and recognized in museums as much as they need to. Um, so that would be the first takeaway. And then my second point is just 
sharing that art with them. I want museum goers to have the chance to appreciate art by Black people, art by women, art by Black women, and to um, take away something from that. Also with the artist cards, I'd like them to just like learn something new, just learn about a new artist they've never heard about and about how cool their work can be. Awesome, thank you so much. Of course. Hi, Rory. Um, thank you so much for your project. It's uh, beyond inspiring. Um, a question for you. Um, you're you're so young for uh, doing uh, your project really is this concept of legacy impact. Uh, when you think in 20 years and you look back, if your project was real, what would you hope that it would have accomplished by the, you know, in 20 years in the future? Um, I definitely want to encourage discussion. So I would hope that people are talking more about Black women artists um, because so often we see in art history textbooks, just white males and um, the work they've created, but art has changed so much since then. So I would hope that there's more conversation around it. Um, also that Black women are better rec recognized in museums, that they're getting paid a fair amount and um, that their work is being shown. Um, and just in general, yeah, for the world to just appreciate art by Black women um, way more than it's being appreciated now. Thank you. Hi, Rory. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on um, how you might extend this work beyond the walls of a museum exhibit. Um, and like, if you had more time, uh, you know, what, what would you do to have this be heard by a wider audience? Right. Um, I think a website would be the primary way I was thinking of creating um, as was mentioned before, museums are digit digitizing exhibits, so I would love to, for this to be digital and for a larger audience to reach that. Um, I'd love to provide users with way more statistics and facts on the issue that I just can't show in one room. Um, and also just for their art to be shown. So through a website, I could show that art um, through a traveling exhibition or just other forms um, such as that. Right. Well, thank you, Rory, for that insightful presentation. I'd love to invite all the finalists back on camera now for a big round of virtual applause. It's been so inspiring to hear all these ways we can impact our communities through data and design, and you should all be so proud of your work. I know you've made it extra tough for the judges this year. Uh, we'll take a short break now. And when we return, our judges will announce the winner of the 2023 National High School Design Competition.
Hello, everybody. I think we're we're back. Yes, we're all here. You um, have made it really, really tough for for all of us uh, to make this decision, but we want to welcome everybody back after the presentations. Um, we all stepped aside for a moment um, to have a, a conversation, um, and we were um, we were having a deep conversation about all three projects, the incredible relevance of all three. And what we're going to do is that we're going to share uh, our our comments on all three of the projects in the same order that you all presented, because we just have such uh, positive feedback for all three groups. And then at the end of that, we uh, we will announce a winner. But we wanted to make sure that everybody heard um, the the incredible impact that we think these uh, these three projects represent. So I'm going to start with Sarah Lee and Clarice Shin. You were the first to present. Thank you so much for that fantastic project. Um, and we wanted to praise you for first the clarity of your communication. Uh, we were all in complete agreement about how well you did in representing the, the, the steps that you took, what took you there, your methodology, your process. You were extremely clear communicators. So really well done because of that. Um, the precision of your process was also uh, very impressive. Uh, you were detailed about every single um, step of it as well. And, uh, and on the other hand, we just also very much uh, loved the personal touch that you brought to it. This was all based on personal experiences that you both have had. And, uh, and we all talked about the importance of empathy as a focus for data, because that data doesn't really mean anything uh, unless we find that emotional connection with it. So you, you really, really excelled at that and, and made it very close for us to experience uh, what, this, what this experience might, might be um, for, for a person with a disability to board on a plane, right? So we'll really lift that. Um, we wanted to also congratulate you on the extraordinary graf graphic quality of your designs. I think we all uh, have seen good and bad airport and plane design, and we know how to recognize it. And just the 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 sheer beauty of, of the pamphlet that you created of the box and the cards, uh, the the uh, how clearly connected graphically those were your your description of all of the of the signs uh, the, you could see the care in every single um, step of that from the graphic to the colors to uh, what all of it signified as a as a system right so um, we wanted to praise you for for all of that so thank you again for sharing your your project with us. Um, I'd love to now move on to Eleanor Lewis's project. You were second to present, and we wanted to give you also um, the the praise and the feedback from uh, from the from the jury. We um, we were all very impressed by the range of data sets that you were able to to juggle, Eleanor. That was a lot of data that you went after, uh, and you were able to just put it all together into a way that was understandable. Um, so um, so that was very impressive to to see. We also very much like the scalability of your topic. Um, you answered a question about how you could see this project taking place and happening in other coastal areas of the country, right? Not just in, in Miami, uh, where your project was focused. So we thought that that aspect was was important and that sort of like bigger picture that you're thinking about. Um, and then, of course, I think it's pretty clear to everybody who saw the presentation that this project is out there. It's real. You showed us a QR code. Someone can literally go to one of these nurseries that you pinpointed now and go get this plant and know whether you know it's going to like do well or not in your neighborhood. Um, so it's very much out there. You can use it today if you want to. Right. So we we appreciated that extra step that you took to to go ahead and implement it and put it out in, into the world. And um we we also talked a little bit about the the extent of your research. You um, you talked to a lot of people and you also communicated that to us. You you told us that you followed Sarah Williams' methodology. You went out there to create this team. Um, so you you rallied all these different uh, forms of expertise and, and experts around you, and that was really good to see that you were able to create this sort of like collaborative team, um, which uh, which also, you know, meant a lot of persistence on your side. You, you talked about emailing and trying to find that data, searching it and sort of like uh, hitting the pavement was the, the term that one of our jury members used to um, to gather the, the right data. And all of that in service of telling a really good story. Right. So also that emotional connection there. So we thought all of those all of those things were, were very impressive about your, your project, Eleanor. So thank you again for for sharing it with us. 
And then I'm going to finish with uh, Rory Stanford and, and her project about intersectionality um, of race and gender in museum representation. So Rory, we um, we, we thank you for bringing um, to, to everybody's attention the relevance of such an unresolved topic. I, I think we were impressed by uh, by your interest in the in the roots of a really systemic issue, right? And and the shock that this uh, that this is an issue that we have to confront and that we have to work with. Um, and I'm just happy that it was represented in today's discussion. So uh, that for the jury was incredibly important. You were also incredibly precise on your goal and the impact that you want to achieve with this uh, with this project as well, which is important. Uh, your your goals are clear. Um, you want people to be talking about this more um, and you express that with with clarity um, and and then uh, we also very much discuss the fact that not only are you creating awareness with this project but you can very actively just learn um, and leave the exhibition you create by learning something new you created a learning opportunity with the with the learning cards so uh, one could be aware of the topic but at the same time you can walk out knowing more about uh, one African American woman artist that you hadn't heard about before, and we thought that that added a lot of value to to the project as well. Um, and lastly, we wanted to to add one more comment about um, the viability of your project. This is a, an exhibition that the jury members thought could be a traveling exhibition that you could take to different museums. Um, it's uh, it's it's sort of like a good format that you've created. It's very specific as to the different parts that it has. You can package it and make it sort of like modular. Um, so that viability uh, was was important as well, and we wanted to make sure to to mention it. So. Um, Thank you to all three teams. Uh, all three projects were exceptional. We were forced to pick a winner. The, there were discussions about ties and giving you all three <laughs> the the top the top position, but but we are forced to pick a winner. And uh, it is my my pride um, to to mention that winner today and to and to name it. So in name of of all of the jury and the discussions that we have, I'd like to announce Eleanor Lewis as our winner. Uh, for the National High School Design Competition. So big congratulations, Eleanor. You really deserve it. It's an exceptional project and you did so, so much uh, work and it really came through. So I want to make sure to give you a chance to say something. <laughs> it's always so weird over Zoom. Um, so if you want to say a few words, you're, you're welcome to do that. Thank you all so much um, for all of your comments and um, also for being here today. And um, I'm I'm just really happy and um, just this has been such an incredible opportunity and I've learned so so much and I really do believe that this has been like life changing for me just the whole process of meeting all of these incredible people and um, getting certified in my ideas and just thank you so much. <laughs> Great. And also, I think it's important to say that all, all three projects will be represented in the exhibition um, as well. So I think we, we take it very seriously to bring in, in bringing all of these um, these resources and these conversations so, the, so that all three of you can be represented. Um, this is also a sort of lifelong relationship that we that we start and it's really kind of up to you to uh, to connect with all of us to follow up with the fellow judges. I think there's a lot of people here um, around the around the virtual table that would love to stay in touch as well as kind of the point of this process as well. So um, so that's something that all all three all three of you um, take away from today. And other than that, I, I want to um, thank you all again for participating in the process. I want to thank our, our jurors and for their very thoughtful commentary um, and, and their expertise. And, and we're always um, impressed by the by the level of professionals that we that we get um, to share our Sunday with us. So thank you to all of you for for joining and for all of, of you who are joining us on YouTube. Thank you for tuning in on Sunday as well. And uh, and please stay tuned for for more projects coming out from of Cooper Hewitt. Um, and we thank you all so very much for watching today.